you may find yourself not finding yourself. You may find yourself wearing active wear, but not having enough energy to actually be active. You may find yourself in another part of the house and you may ask yourself, what did I come in here for? So Whisper Sisters was set up um, around about 2018 and it was as a result of conversations with approximately 450 women through various health campaigns that had been run um, across our two centres. Women were talking about health conditions. Women were talking to me about anxiety, depression, low mood, chronic fatigue. And for a while, I didn't make the connection. I didn't make the connection. So what I did was I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm hearing all these stories and a woman's voice, anybody's voice needs to be heard when it's so many women. But what was really, really um, hit home with me was that these women were whispering. They were whispering. I almost, six months in, I think I'd developed a crock in my neck because it's like he's speaking to me. Um, and I started to see that when women were talking, so I'd made the connection that it was menopause. Um, and the, this array of different symptoms that women were talking about and the pain and the anguish, but the shame. It was the shame that women were feeling. The, they didn't want people to know they were, you know, entering perimenopause. They were going through menopause or they were postmenopausal, whatever that means. Um, and it was very, very sad. But you have to turn that into a positive because if I thought if five, nearly 500 women who I've spoken to over a set amount of time are having these experiences, having these symptoms, this is bigger than just individuals, right? And that was when I started to develop my understanding, even though I was in my fifties. Yeah. I just thought I was getting old and that's why the fatigue was there. Um, never, my understanding at that point of menopause was hot flushes and being a bit eccentric or mad. That was all I knew. Um, and it was through talking and through reading that I thought, no, we have to do something. Women have to have a voice. The whispering has to stop. We have to be proud and we have to stand in our own shoes. And to do that, it doesn't matter whether you wear red lipstick, whether you bring out your rainbow scarf or your purple hat, whatever it's going to take for women to come out and be proud and embrace the changes. And that's when Whisper Sisters began. So I brought a group of those women together and we had um, a network meeting and I said, right, what are your thoughts? And I collated everybody's thoughts and what the, the community wanted to do about it. And um, they said it would be just fantastic just not to be able to whisper. So with surgical menopause, the decline in the level of hormones is almost instant, you know. So if you're removing somebody's ovaries, they don't have the, um, they don't have the effect of a gradual decline of hormones, which would happen naturally. So all of a sudden, their hormones have been taken away. And so they will go through a sudden onset of menopause and they may start to experience the symptoms of menopause almost overnight. I was told that I'm going to have to use a hysterectomy through period problems, but nobody explained to me what would happen or what I should have expected through having the menopause. I just had it and that was it. 
So maybe I was going through the menopause, but not knowing that I was actually going through it. In my 30s, when I finally get a diagnosis for endometriosis, that led to an operation called an oophorectomy, where they removed one ovary with the whole mass around it. So I had a total hysterectomy, um, and at that time, um, you're talking five years ago, um, when I, I was looking for information, there was nothing, you know, there was um, some really, really dodgy sites that were very dark and not very helpful. So I was expecting the worst. So I was in a bit of a, a bit of a panic. So I went out and did this like mad buy on fans and cooling pillars because this website had told me I was going to wake up a sweaty mess. Somebody who has had surgery where the ovaries have been removed. So um, someone may have another reason to have surgery. They may have a cyst or a tumour or sometimes endometriosis where patients choose to have surgery and the doctors would advise the ovaries to be removed. I ended up having to have major abdominal surgery because of the abscess that grew, because of the combination of the infection, the endometriosis and the problems that were going on with the cysts. And then after I had the hysterectomy, like I said before, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. Hysterectomy, no, no advice, no help, nothing at all. So it was just a big problem, going through the sweats, going through the change and not knowing exactly what it was all about. I get women coming to see me that have never been warned that they might go into a menopause after they've had surgery or after they've had treatment and find it very, very frightening. So my mum, she went through early menopause um, when she was um, only 40 and I know, um, I was young at the time, but as I became a medical student and subsequently a doctor, I realised how little help and support she had herself. Um, and, and throughout my career, I have seen that story uh, play over several times. I've seen women not being given the information, not being given the support that they need um, at this very important change um, in their lives. But now that I know about menopause, I'd been through perimenopause and I was really lucky because every woman's menopause is absolutely unique. And so I hadn't had like dramatic hot sweats. I hadn't had um, panic. I hadn't had depression, but I had chronic fatigue. And that was actually crippling for somebody that's like, loves cleaning. Because I remember having a conversation with myself on my coffee table, because I hadn't been done for three weeks. I think because, by, because of everything I'd been through, by the time it actually came to my menopause, I had learnt to slow down. I had learnt to listen to my body. And I was practising Qigong to help me heal. And I was working with herbs to help me heal. The information that I was getting from our menopause group, Whisper Sisters, all of that really helped me to to treat myself well and not not really end up suffering. I'm wondering how when we start to look at the menopause as something that happens to women in midlife, how we can include this very different group of women who are experiencing symptoms but have very different needs because they are so much younger. When I was speaking to my doctor, then she started explaining to me, but otherwise than that, and I'm 61 now, so I've been going through it for 25 years. So <clears throat> it's a shame though, because when we have these things, they should be able to explain to us so that we can make up our mind if we want to go through such a dramatic change in life.
you may find yourself feeling feelings. Some of these feelings are new feelings. Suddenly, you may find yourself feeling really f***ed off with everything. And you need to let it go. I think I probably started perimenopause around 42, which is when I started with a whole lot of really unpleasant um, genital urinary si symptoms, you know, around bladder and urethra and, and vulval pain. I think what I, what I have had is some of the common symptoms around um, hot sweats a lot, not feeling myself and always feeling really tired and exhausted, cold sweats and I thought it was me imagining it and every time I've gone to a doctor for support they never mention the, the, the menopause to me and sometimes I think is it about my identity that they don't talk about the menopause to me or is it because they're not looking at me from that point of view because I don't fit in the age bracket of women who at what point they commonly would go through perimenopause. Pehle jo tha wo itne zyada um, heavy period nahi aate the lekin ab jaise heavy period aaye aa rahe hain aur uske saath phir um, time jo hai every month different time hota hai kabhi week pehle ya timing ki changing bhi ho rahi hai aur uske saath mera ye tha ki hot flashes wagaira baal gir rahe hain girna shuru ho gaye hain aur hot flashes aur heart beat bahut zyada tez meri ho rahi thi to phir maine सर्च किया ऑनलाइन ही कि क्या ये इसकी वजह से तो नहीं हो रहे तो फिर मैंने मैंने फील किया कि शायद मेरा प्री मैनपोज स्टार्ट हो गया फिर मैंने अपने फ्रेंड्स से बात की उनका मे बी ये हो सकती हैं ये स्टेजेस हों तो आपके स्टार्ट हों तो इस वजह से फिर मैंने रिकोगनाइज़ किया कि ये प्री मैनपोज शुरू हो टाइम चल रहा है मेरा <laughs> Um, and around this time, women will notice certain changes to their cycle, their periods, their mood, energy, um, libido, um, changes to their skin, their hair. So women are aware of something changing, but they are not always certain as to why this is happening. Um, a common example would be a patient coming to me and saying, I feel far more anxious or I can't sleep. Um, and I'm not sure why this is. Um, and often, um, a lot of these women are treated by antidepressants because no one is thinking about perimenopause and menopause. Along comes the perimenopause and kind of hits them out of the blue. They have no idea what's going on. And suddenly they start to feel underconfident. The things that they used to take for granted and just do without even thinking, they'd suddenly feel actually, I don't feel I can do this, kind of a absolute loss of confidence, particularly in the workplace. And sadly, that can often lead to women, you know, prematurely leaving their, their jobs because they just don't feel that they're able to cut it anymore. I think I started in my mid 40s, early to mid 40s. Um, it runs in the family that um, the women do go through the menopause quite um, young, but I didn't know that I was perimenopausal. Um, I had other health issues. So it masked a lot of the symptoms. I think I was about 50 when I realised I was experiencing the menopause. Um, I had really bad night sweats, but it, it didn't occur to me that it might be the menopause. It was a friend who suggested that I went to see my GP. This thing, I don't know what the menopause is and when is it happening. कब किस एज में होता है क्योंकि हमारे कल्चर में तो बहुत इस चीज़ को छुपाया भी जाता है और खुल के बात नहीं होती कि हमारे बड़े या जो भी हमारा माहौल है उसके अंदर ये बात खुल के की नहीं जाती इसलिए हमें पता ही नहीं था कि ये मनोपोज क्या है तो मुझे इस चीज़ का कोई इलम नहीं था लेकिन इसके साथ ये है कि मेरी थर्टी फर्स्ट एज इतनी ही होगी कि मुझे मेरे क्योंकि मेरे सात आठ मिस कैरिजेज हुए तो मुझे इस चीज़ का अंदाज़ा ही नहीं था कि मनोपोज क्या है क्योंकि मेरे आफ्टर मिस कैरिजेज मुझे बहुत ज़्यादा मेरी ब्लीडिंग होती थी कई कई महीने कई लगातार साल साल भी होती थी तो मुझे पता ही नहीं था कि ये क्या चीज़ है इसलिए मुझे इस चीज़ का कोई इलम नहीं था 
One of the changes that happens with perimenopause is cycles get shorter. So for example, someone who's had a cycle every 30 days might start to have a cycle every 25 days or 21 days. And as a consequence, the number of days they are feeling low goes up. Um, and what compounds all of this is they are not sleeping well because they have hot sweats, they feel tired. Um, and often these are women who are at a point in their life where the demands on them are huge, you know, at home, at work. Um, often there are women who are at peaks of their career. Uh, I went to the doctors because my periods had changed and became more frequent. Um, I was bleeding really, really heavily. So I thought I was maybe going through the perimenopause. So I didn't know. Went to the doctors to try to get a, a diagnosis or a blood test to find out my hormone levels. And from that was where it began. I, first, I was offered a sexual health test. Then I was sent for several scans, which was really unnecessary. I must have cost a fortune. Um, so I don't even know the exact time when I started my menopause. The biggest problem for me was the sleep deprivation. It was almost three years that I didn't sleep properly. Many women and in the run-up to the menopause, so in the perimenopausal phase of the menopause, their sleep can be massively affected because of the hot sweats or the night flushes, whatever they might be experiencing. So you have a bad night's sleep and your, your brain will struggle to consolidate and lay down the memory of that day. That's what our brain does during the night. So a poor quality sleep will massively affect the brain. The second thing is your prefrontal cortex, which is here, which is our um, executive functioning of our brain, relies heavily on oestrogen. So we have oestrogen receptors in that area and it relies very heavily on oestrogen. So our executive functioning is how we um, articulate our memory, our thoughts, how we plan, how we action. So as these oestrogen levels start to decline, that functionality can decline too. What women mean when they ask me this question, how long will menopause last, is I think what they want to ask is how long will my symptoms last? Uh, and that could be how long will I get my hot flushes? How long can I carry on getting up at two o'clock in the morning? Um, I, think, I think that's what they mean when they ask. So symptoms such as hot flushes average is up to three years for most women, but sometimes some women will carry on having them for 10 years plus. I would have liked to have been able to recognise that it was the perimenopause that was happening. So I would have liked that information to be out there, that it wouldn't just be my periods would stop and I'd get hot flushes, that actually these symptoms, the, the anxiety and the memory loss and the vulval and vaginal and urethral and bladder symptoms, that they were all to do with that loss of oestrogen in the body. So often I get women who come to me and say, I could multitask, I could do 10 jobs at the same time. I never felt so anxious and I don't know why I can't cope with the smallest of thing now. And, and they often feel like they're letting themselves down, they're letting their families down. And I think it's not understanding that their hormones are playing a big part um, and it's not them failing. I'm still actually in perimenopause. <laughs> 14 years later, <laughs> I've still not stopped menstruating. <laughs> so yeah, so if you think kind of sitting perimenopause out is an option, it really might not be. Some of you may find yourself struggling. Struggling doing things you normally did with ease. Some of you may find yourself doing inappropriate things in inappropriate places, but this too will pass. There are 34 symptoms currently associated with menopause. And you won't necessarily, because every woman's menopause is unique to her, you not you may not experience all of those. You might do. It might be for a week, it might be for two weeks, and then something else comes in. 
you know, I remember having um, really itchy skin for two weeks and then it went. But in that two weeks, I thought, oh, have I got some kind of a disease? You know, or when I realised it was something, a, a, a symptom associated with menopause, I thought, well, is that it for the next seven, 15 years? But it just come and it went. One hot sweat, which was absolutely huge. I was stood in a puddle of water in the middle of Barbados on a cool day. Um, at my one big hot sweat and then it was prickly heat, yeah? And now it's just occasionally. Because it's so unique, it was so different. Um, and that's what I think adds to maybe the misdiagnosis of women. But yeah, at the moment, 34, but by the end of the film, could be 144. And menopause is, um, it's, it's an interesting time in every woman's life. Um, it's, it's a time to almost pause and take stock of your own health. And the reason it is important is because certain health risks change with menopause. So to give you an example, the risk of heart diseases in women before menopause is a lot lower than men. Once they go through menopause, the risk is as high as men. So the protective effect of our hormones, estrogen on our heart is gone. And likewise, our bones, they start to get thinner and weaker. So the risk of osteoporosis goes up after menopause. And certain types of cancers, for example, cancer of the womb, cancer of the ovary, all these risks, they start to go up after menopause. So stress and the menopause, it's a really interesting kind of dual combination. Stress, cortisol. So cortisol is a stress hormone. It's um, a hormone that is released in response to us feeling stressed. Tell me now, who isn't stressed? We live in a really high octane lifestyle. Many stresses, you know, the economy, job redundancy, lockdown, and what stress can do, raised levels of cortisol affect the memory part of the brain, which is called the hypothalamus. And it really can affect that memory part of that brain. Also the hippocampus, which is another part of the brain that is very, very heavily associated with memory. So that triple whammy of poor quality sleep, declining levels of estrogen, and high levels of stress, high level of cortisol, it's a triple whammy for people that are on the menopause. The best way I can describe it is to say it was like somebody take my brain apart and put it back together all in the wrong order. So just my emotional reactions to things changed. I couldn't pick things up as quickly as I've been able to. I couldn't concentrate in the same way I've been able to. So at first I thought I've just got a mental health problem and I should have gone to the doctor with that, but, but, but didn't. Brain fog was another quite debilitating symptom I experienced because I was still working at the time um, and short-term memory loss was another one so you know they all compounded together and impacted on my self-esteem and my self-confidence and it was a, a real struggle to get help. The menopause can have an enormous effect on the brain because as I've just mentioned these fluctuating hormones can impact not only our, our kind of stress part of our brain, but our memory. So I'm sure that you've seen many women that say, I mean, most certainly I have when the conferences that we present for Manchester Stress Institute, I'm really worried about my memory. I mean, I'm worried to the point where I'm thinking of going to the doctors because I think I've got early onset dementia. Workplace needs to recognize and support women who are struggling right? Uh, but they also need to be very careful about how they approach menopause. Menopause is not a disease. I was a rep when I was 20. I knew nothing about it. My mother had told me one day something might happen and I'd seen her taking a cardi off because she was too warm and that was about the extent of my knowledge. But looking back, I've represented lots of older women in the workplace and I'm a civil servant, so the majority of, of workers are women. Um, so it didn't seem unusual that there were lots of cases with women either because the majority of the workforce were women. But the issues 
I think for a lot of them could have easily been related to the menopause. So I got lots of capability cases where people were being told you're not working well enough. Sickness absence cases where people were off with mental health. And when I spoke to them, part of the problem was they were struggling at work. And it was all described as like, older people can't cope with change. Well, older women, can't cope with change in the same way because they're going through the menopause and if they don't understand what's happening to themselves then they, they just kind of think it's all their fault and the employer thinks it's all their fault and I am quite sure I've represented people who ended up losing the jobs in the 50s women in the 50s because they didn't realize neither side realized that, that they were going through the menopause. I was working for myself, um, I was running my own business. At that point I was running a business um, going into schools as, as a writer, as a poet. Um, so it, it, was all on, it was all on me. Um, so there, were, there was nobody to make adjustments except myself. And, and what actually happened is while I was struggling with really quite considerable amounts of pain, um, dealing with some fairly mind altering uh, side effects of some of the drugs I was prescribed f for what was supposedly nerve pain, um, is that I really couldn't manage to keep that business going. It, it faltered. Um, I was able to meet some of my commitments. I wasn't able to kind of do the networking and bringing in new work. So gradually that business just kind of faltered and I had to let go of it. It got to the point, I produce films, I'm a producer, I'm on the phone all day, I meet with people all day. It got to the point where I couldn't pick the phone up. Sometimes I couldn't make a phone call, sometimes I couldn't answer the phone and I didn't know what was wrong with me. There are women who don't want to talk about it and that's absolutely fine, you know. Um, the culture where jokes are made at workplace about anything to do with female hormones, I think that needs to completely stop. Uh, women who want to access help, there should be a workplace policy. Department of Health has guidance on support of uh, women through menopause, which every employer has a duty to follow. I think when you work with a woman, when you're working with strategies to support her holistically, then yes, I see a great deal of success with herbal medicine, but it's not just a herbal approach, it's also looking at other aspects as well, which are things like diet and lifestyle. I definitely think there's a link between menopause and, the, uh, and alcohol. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, so alcohol creates blood vessel dilation, which can exacerbate your hot sweats. Hot flashes, they're properly known as, but also, uh, alcohol is a depressant. Now, if you're suffering with anxiety and depression, uh, I say depression, there's a difference between hormonal depression and clinical depression, as in someone who's depressed. Hormonal depression is different. We don't get, we, or we tend not to have antidepressants for that. It's it's through HRT and, and other, other things. But if you're uh, taking a, a depressant and you are anxious and depressed, alcohol is just going to make it 10 times worse. So um, a lot of women or anybody drinks because they feel anxious and depressed. Alcohol makes them feel anxious and depressed. So they drink on that. It's a massive vicious circle. Add menopause into the mix with that and you just got a recipe for disaster. And I know from experience, you know, years of alcohol abuse, then the menopause, you know, and, and as a nation, we are drinkers. So it wasn't until I stopped drinking that my depression lifted. I wasn't actually depressed at, at all. It was, um, it was brought on by alcohol. So you can imagine if you take alcohol away from um, a menopausal woman, well, you'd have to fight them for it first, but, <laughs> but if, you, if you take alcohol out of the mix, then it definitely helps um, with your menopause symptoms. So if you are drinking, you know, it is a, it's definitely a factor. Every woman's menopause is going to be different. Every woman's experience around sex and libido is going to be different. The one sure thing is, is that because the ovaries are producing less estrogen and progesterone, you will have some changes. So let's say changes 
So it might be that your libido drops. It might be that you you know you're you want to have more intimacy. It may be that you just don't think about sex as often. It may be that you need time to build up to um, wanting that intimacy. You want it in, in in a different way. You may want to be. You might want to be more ad, you know adventurous and experiment a bit more. I think to say to all the partners out there that women don't want to have sex because you're going through menopause or that you're menopausal is wrong. You know, psychological symptoms of menopause, I think, are often um, under-discussed. Uh, I think we, we have focused pretty much in the past um, very much on the physical symptoms of uh, the menopause. So, you know, we're all accustomed with things like hot flushes. We know that um, it can cause brain fog and that kind of thing. But actually, the, the often unspoken symptom of acute anxiety, um, often in women who've never experienced anxiety before or in those that have a real exacerbation of, um, of those symptoms. It can also cause severe depression uh, and feelings of low mood uh, and a general kind of feeling of you know, low confidence and um, poor self-worth and just really kind of um, a lack of self-esteem. My main major problems was anxiety. I had no idea that anxiety, I had no idea what anxiety was, let alone that it was connected to, to the menopause. It got to the point where there was sometimes, I didn't want to be here, you know, I'd, 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 I couldn't cope anymore. And you don't want to tell people, you're working in the community, you don't want, you know, mental health, I didn't want anyone to know what was wrong with me. So you hide it away. The only people who knew what was wrong with was my family at home. So I've managed to completely mask it and hide it from everywhere else but I was in an absolute state. I did suffer from depression, anxiety, and the, you know, I have stupid things running through my head. Um, but then I just put it all to the back of my head and carried on as normal, but at the same time, it was getting me down, but then, I think the judgment as well with a different culture, you have to be strong. So that's what it was like, just going forward, doing as you're supposed to do, look after your family, and you don't come first, you come last. Yes, I started to know it's changing my wife uh, during the menopause. Uh, mood swings, headaches, aches. I remember we used to do a lot of walking and that sort of slowed down. Um, she, she got up, 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 up flushy sort of thing up and she used to say to me, turn the fire down. Well, to me, for a Yorkshire man, they're great. You turn the fire down, it was like burning money. So, so I was pleased with that. So this particular day, she, she, it, it, was a, it, was, it was a Wednesday and she all got ready to go to work. I've got to take her down to work and she says, I can't go into work. What? Now she'd never missed a day off work, so it, that was a big issue. She said, I can't go into work. I, why? She said, I can't, I've got COVID. I said, what do you mean you've got COVID? I've, I've caught COVID. How do you know? I do, I've got a pain in my chest. I've got this and I'm, I've got COVID. I says, yeah. Anyway, I rung the doctor up. She got on the phone to the doctor. She went through all the symptoms. Do, do, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then she said, can I have the phone? So I got the phone of my wife and I talked to the doctor. I said, uh, what do you think? What? She said, it's, it's anxiety, not COVID. I thought, oh, I didn't think it was COVID, but she said, I've got anxiety. She's got anxiety. I thought, oh, well, that's summer. And I, I went into the corner. I said to the doctor, I'm still concerned. I said, she's quite, she's getting more and more withdrawal now. It's not my wife, as I know her. I said, I'm really scared. Sometimes when it's a psychological symptom that you're experiencing, it's very hard to kind of separate things out and sort of like, what's going, what, what is it? Is it my head or is it, is it something else? Well, actually, it's something else. It is a chemical interaction in your body that's causing an impact on your mood. So I think just kind of recognising that that is very real. It's not all in your head. And actually there's a physiological process that's behind all of this. Saturday morning I went to bed and she stared at me, she's crying. I said, what, what, what's, what's the matter, what, what's that now? 
I haven't got COVID, but you've got it. I said, oh, flipping it. I've got it. I said, you're flipping joking. I've got some barbells by me, and I'm getting up. I'm doing all the. I'm doing. Look, I've got flipping COVID. You know, yeah, flipping it. Then I took it from there. Went for the walk. I walked a bit too fast. I've been tired myself. So when I walked around, I said, don't. I haven't got COVID. Don't don't pass on to me. I haven't got it. That was Saturday. We come back from the walk. We went to do a, a mum's dinner, and I went over to see how she's doing. She's she's looking at her mum. I says, what's up now? She says, my mum's got it. I said, oh, come on, what's up with you? What, 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 what's all this? Your mum ain't got it. I, I've done all the tests, she hasn't got it. Anyway, I went out and did the mum's garden. She came back over to this house over here. And uh, I went a bit too long in the garden. I thought, oh, I better go, I'll check on her. As so I came, she went in the house. I went upstairs and she was upstairs. I thought, oh, right. And she's, uh, she's doing her nails and she's getting herself done. I thought, oh, she's coming around a little bit. And I sat on the bed where we did some more exercises on the anxiety side of things and I gave her a bit of a, a cuddle and a love. And it got to the usual time. I said, I better go put them to bed. And she's known about three quarters of an hour before she puts them to bed. She goes over there and sits with her half an hour and puts her to bed about a quarter of an hour. Uh, so I said, I'll come over with you. She said, no, no, you put the supper on. I said, yeah, you put the supper on. I won't be long, right? So she went over there and I I could time it just right, so I timed it for when she come back about three quarters of an hour. And she was, oh, where's, where is she? Where is she? Flipping egg. Oh, flipping egg. So I thought, her mum must have messed her. She's cleaning mum. Oh, flipping egg. Supper's got to be ruined. So I went across the road, opened the door, and I, I, I went upstairs. And um, and uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, that, 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 that last time I um, saw, saw me, saw me, saw me, uh, my wife alive sort of thing. It's got to stop ignoring this, you know, with, with, the, with the partners. They've, we've got to um, got to read about it, understand the symptoms. There's some severe symptoms now. Not everybody goes through the, the the severe symptoms, but every woman goes through some sort of some sort of menopause. So they need to read about it and um, get the understanding, the awareness out there, and literally talk to your talk to your partner. And, and listen to the that's a big one as well as well as talking to her listen to her as well be compassionate older older and just talk to her get her through it together you know end it day it's, it's your most treasured loved one you've got some of you may find yourself still having feelings some of them will be the same as before, but some will inspire you to change things. Some of you will become activists. Some of you will care less, which is also an act of activism in itself. There are some NHS protocols for care of menopausal and perimenopausal women, but these vary vastly depending on where you are. Um, so some hospitals have very clear guidelines and some hospitals don't. So some hospitals have specialist menopause clinics, but most of the NHS hospitals still don't have a specialist menopause clinic. I've not been recommended any treatment for the whole of the menopause. From the beginning, um, I've had cancer um, 15 years ago, which was vulval cancer. And because of that, I wasn't able to take HRT. But I've taken off my own volition, I've taken some, some supermarket um, herbal menopause, but I can't say they actually worked. So I've gone through the whole menopause basically on my own with nothing. I didn't go to the doctor. Once I'd figured out what it was, I was then able to figure out how to deal with it. So as once I realised what it was, I just went around telling everybody all the time that, that this is what's, what's happening to me. So my boss at work is sick of hearing about it, you know, but I know I'm making mistakes. I know there's times I can't concentrate, but I know that's because of the menopause, so I can deal with it and explain it to other people. You know, if I've had some irrational row with somebody about nothing, I'll just apologise and say, well, sorry, I'm going through the menopause. Lots of people find themselves in this situation. 
नो नो एनी ट्रीटमेंट बिकॉज आई स्पोक टू माई फ्रेंड्स मैंने अपने दोस्तों से बात की तो उन्होंने जैसे वो डॉक्टर के पास गए हैं तो डॉक्टर ने कहा कि इस नॉर्मल और वैसे भी जैसे हम जैसे एक मेंटली प्रपेयर के ये होना है तो इस वजह से अगर कोई बहुत ज़्यादा प्रॉब्लम हो तो फिर डॉक्टर के पास सोचूंगी जाने के लिए लेकिन अभी कुछ है नहीं और वैसे भी जो मेरी फ्रेंड डॉक्टर के पास गई है डॉक्टर ने कोई हेल्प नहीं उनकी की तो इस वजह से फिर जाने का डॉक्टर के पास कोई फ़ायदा नहीं है तो इस वजह से फिर मैं डॉक्टर के पास नहीं गई खुद ही अपने आप को मतलब मेंटली प्रपेयर और कोई जो चीज़ें मुझे कम्फर्ट दे सकती हैं तो मैं मतलब यूज़ कर रही I didn't really seek much help with this problem from my GP based on the first time that I was diagnosed where I was told that I seemed to be doing really well with it and I didn't need HRT so I went to seek out more natural remedies and just seeking out information it was a lack of information really and lack of understanding of what was going on with my body I don't think the bit they are being given alternatives apart from HRT or antidepressants or other drugs and I do realize that sometimes some women do find that really useful and find that that is something that has helped them and made a difference to the life so I'm not saying there isn't a place for that but that each woman should be offered a choice in which way that she sort of journeys through that menopause so if you know what foods to choose you can have a significant impact on your energy, your focus, your concentration, and your sleep throughout the menopause. So the primary things I would say today to have an impact within a couple of days is need to increase our proteins because proteins are made from amino acids and amino acids help to make neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters, we have two primary classifications. We have stimulatory neurotransmitters and they literally make you go ping I feel awake I feel alert I've got energy you know my concentration my focus my memory that's from stimulatory neurotransmitters their job is to stimulate your brain I'm always really reluctant to talk about specific herbal remedies or herbs for women because every woman's different. And I always like to work with a holistic approach to supporting a woman. So if somebody comes to see me for a consultation as a herbalist, I will see what's happening with lots of different aspects in the body. I'll do a consultation, I'll find out where a woman's at, what's happening with her. But I tend to look at things like what's happening, I'll give herbs to support often how a woman copes with stress, you know, how her digestive tract is, how, whether she needs liver support, whether she needs adrenal support, and I will look at aspects of diet, look at what's happening with the diet, what's happening with the gut. So it's never a straight answer when people say to me, or it's quite often they'll message me on Facebook or email me, what can I take? And it's never as complex as that. As a herbalist, we work holistically, we work with the body. And I think when people start to associate one herb with one symptom, that that's when, and then people say that herbs don't work because a herbalist never works like that at all. And it's working with somebody that is going through that menopausal transition, it's not even just about herbs, it's about lifestyle as well. It's about diet, it's what's in that diet, what should be in that diet, what shouldn't be within that diet. And what I would say is I've mentioned the proteins, make sure that you increase your protein profile, that's a definite. You need healthy fats, our brain is 60% fat, it's made from fats, so we need to really increase in fats. Now you can take a good fish oil supplement, that is um, something that everybody can do and that will really enhance memory, concentration and focus. But primarily what you want to do is make sure that your macronutrients, and the macronutrients are so called because we eat these food groups in larger quantities. So the macronutrients are proteins, carbohydrates and fats. You want to get the right ratio of them. When I work with menopausal women, I like to look at what's happening in the gut because you know the gut can be affected during menopause, but it's, it's the gut is also a place that uh, or the, the microbiome also helps in the production of some of the um, hormones and chemicals that help us feel good, like serotonin and can also be, have an impact on our hormonal profiles. So 
most herbalists and natural health practitioners tend to look at the gut as a very sort of prime way of sort of supporting healthcare. So when I work with a woman going through the menopause, I always ask her questions about what's happening with her gut. You know, does she get indigestion? You know, does she get bloating? What's the poo like? And for that, that gives me an eye, or even a history of antibiotics, the pill, or lifestyle to see what is happening with the gut. And quite often, I encourage women to support health of the gut or to go on probiotics. Or what I really like to do is encourage women to ferment food themselves. And I think that's a really empowering way of getting a broad range of um, probiotic foods and prebiotic foods into the diet that's quite expensive and is a lot more empowering than just keep buying probiotics from the health food shop. But also within the gut, we manufacture tryptopan. Now, tryptopan is a neurotransmitter. We manufacture about 70% of tryptopan in the gut. So we need a really good environment within the gut to, this, to enable this manufacture of this neurotransmitter, this hormone. What does, new, what does tryptopan do in the brain? It's, it's um, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It calms the body down. So some of the people that are watching this now might be on an antidepressant called Prozac. And what Prozac is as an antidepressant, it's known as an SSRI, which is, which is called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And what that means is it selectively inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. So a tryptopan helps to manufacture serotonin. So you can actually, you can, by choosing the right diet and generating a really good environment in your gut, manufacture your own tryptopan, which will make serotonin, which will help to ease sensations of anxiety and lift mood. A few women that I see ask me about HRT and whether they should be on it or not. I like to leave it up to that woman. I think choice is very, very important. So a lot of women will say once they've got on HRT, I feel like me again. I feel like me again. That's because that estrogen's been, been replaced. Um, but what we know for women that can't take HRT, and there most certainly are a percentage of the population that can't take HRT, the great news there is eventually your brain will get used to the lower levels of estrogen. Um, and I wish a lot more women were offered um, help and support for menopause and perhaps HRT instead of antidepressants. All the uh, doctors give the uh, hormone therapy for the menopause, but uh, they told me we are not agree with this because it's a maybe gay uh, in a in a future maybe you have a, in a uh, some uh, cancer or a breast cancer or something else. They didn't give me. Uh, so I started taking HRT. Um, I would like to say the doctor recommended it, but actually I demanded it. Um, because I, I knew what my symptoms were. We had a discussion over the phone because it was um, lockdown, so I didn't get a face-to-face -face, uh, appointment. It was a female GP um, and she agreed that, you know, I was going through the menopause um, and I just said basically to her, um, you know, you know my past history, I'm a recovering alcoholic, I cannot afford to feel the way I'm feeling, um, the anxiety, the mood swings, the de you know, uh, depression. Um, can you give me HRT? And she agreed and said absolutely. Obviously, she checked that I was suitable. Um, so I've been taking HRT for about a year, over a year now. Um, so I ended up on the low dose contraceptive pill kind of by accident because we thought it might manage my IBS symptoms, which we thought might be interconnected. Um, and that just fixed it pretty much overnight because it was a hormonal problem. And because that just neatly sorts out your levels of estrogen and progesterone. And I was kind of fine on that for quite a while until I had to come off it because I was getting older and they get, you know, jumpier and jumpier about you being on, on the contraceptive pill, the older you get. And as soon as I came off it, those symptoms came back. When it comes to actual prescription of um, medication, HRT, the prescription that most British menopause society recognised specialists um, prescribe is not much different. So we all um, 
prefer more modern, more uh, natural products. Uh, we have moved away from the old-fashioned synthetic HRT, um, but we don't um, encourage use of compounded but unregulated HRT. Um, I think the doctor was very helpful when I went and asked for the help that I wanted. So I asked for HRT um, and I, I take that still and that's very useful. And I also asked for vaginal estrogen. And again, despite the fact of having this long history of vaginal problems and being in menopause, I had to go and say, can we please try vaginal estrogen? Um, so, and it's, in, it's been incredibly useful. It has been life changing. Because my operation, my, my um, hysterectomy, had to be done bec because I had cancer um, and the cancer was oestrogen derived and wasn't suitable for HRT. Would I have taken HRT when you read the leaflets? Probably not because of the p potential, potential, and that's what I'm going to say, possible side effects. Um, and in my family, we, we've also got a history of um, cancer, breast cancer. So for me, even though the original cancer was estrogen derived, there was the added complication of breast cancer in the family. But I, I, for me personally, I wanted to go down a more natural route. I wanted to just find some foods that I could eat that had some natural estrogen in it. Um, and it works and sometimes it doesn't work and you've, you've got to keep you know, it's a bit like foraging in the forest for information. And at that time, there was an out, you know, so I just had to ask friends who had nutritional information, you know, who had qualifications around nutrition and menopause. And that was how I got through it. Just finding bits and pieces that I could. And in fact, what was happening is I went round to specialist after specialist. I saw pain specialists, I saw um, gynaecologists, I saw urologists, um, I saw so many different, I saw um, dermatologists, that was the other one. And I'd, I'd be sitting there going, so does this have anything to do with my hormones? And they'd go, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> and I think now, because I'm a bit further on and a bit nowtier about the whole thing. And I said, yes, it is a good question and it's one that merits an answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've got 1.3 million women each year entering the menopause. And we've got to look at the health inequalities and how women are um, treated um, from first contact, doctor surgeries, practice nurses, we want, I hope that we can get the medical profession to take this seriously as a medical emergency. Some of you may find yourself breezing through it as if it was nothing. Some of you may think, oh, it's just a small distraction. And some of you may have an epic, life-changing response. And you may find yourself having to take your cardigan off. My advice to you young ladies and older ladies is to find a group in your area. You can also go to your doctor, but do not let your doctors fob you off. Stand for your rights where the doctor's concerned because it's your health at the end of the day. Or you can go to the library like I did and get a menopause box. They've got plenty of books there that you can read through as well that would help you as well. 
when it comes to the menopause that what we need to do is be more more open and honest about what is available one on through our NHS what support is available and also I know that there is so much support now being offered that there wasn't a few years ago and, and I'm sure in every area there will be some kind of support group and if you just use a finding tool to find where's your local menopause support group I would really encourage women to you know access that information pick up that phone send that email send that message but basically talk about it. We need to talk about it to be able to address the problem. The Asian people don't like to speak about the menopause and uh, period. It is, uh, they shy maybe. If they, because in the past, in a, I uh, re read to some books, they, uh, they don't have to speak about that time. Our community or our country, कभी डिस्कस ही नहीं हुआ इर्द गिर्द या हमारे बड़े बुजुर्गों में या होता है कि हमारी जितनी भी कम्युनिटी के होते हैं वो एक शाये इस चीज को समझते हुए कुछ किसी को कोई अवेयरनेस ही नहीं है ना कोई देता है इस चीज का अब भी अब मैं भी अभी स्टार्ट हो चुका है पाकिस्तान में ये चीज लेकिन इससे पहले हमने कभी नहीं था सुना सब हमारे बड़े बुजुर्ग जो भी थे हमारे कल्चर में वो शेम फील करते थे और बच्चों के सामने किड्स के सामने वो ऐसी बातें ही नहीं कोई शेयर करते थे जिसकी वजह से हमें कोई अवेयरनेस नहीं है और होनी चाहिए होनी चाहिए कि जिंदगी एक ही बार मिलती है बार-बार तो नहीं मिलती और इस लाइफ को संभालना ये बड़ी कीमती चीज है I work with so many women from different backgrounds, different cultures, different religions. It's still very much not talked about. And I think that in my own community, I feel like there's just so much more. We need to be having these conversations with women because they, that what they think is going on with their body, they're not realizing that this is part of either their perimenopausal or they are going through the menopause. And some women actually go their whole life through and go through the menopause without any support or any acknowledgement or any treatment and they've not realized that you know they've suffered all them years main unko ye kahungi ki apna aap khayal rakhe aap apne aap ko ye na heavy kare ke mere upar ye kaun sa time aa gaya kyunki hamari community mein ye bhi ek misunderstanding auraton ke zehen mein dali gayi hai ke ke jaise ab ab unke menopause ho jayega to wo auraton ki jo life hai wo jaise old ho gayi hai बूढ़ी हो गई हैं तो वो खत्म हो गई है जो एक जो एक एक्टिव वुमेन का रोल है वो खत्म होता जा रहा है उसका नहीं ऐसे नहीं है बल्कि एक और आपके ऊपर टाइम स्टार्ट हो रहा है कि आप अपनी जिम्मेदारियां वो कम हो गई हैं तो आप अपने ऊपर ज्यादा अपनी केयर करें अपने ऊपर तवज्जो दें अपनी बॉडी की सुने अपनी सुने और फिर अपने आप को बेहतर करें इसके साथ कि ये कोई ऐसा टाइम नहीं है कोई ऐसी चीज नहीं है जिसके ऊपर आप को कुछ शर्म या कोई चीज फील करने की जरूरत नहीं है शर्मिंदा होने की जरूरत नहीं है ये एक टाइम है ये बहुत आपको उसके लिए प्रिपेयर होना चाहिए एक्चुअली इन वन ऑफ द रीजंस व्हाई आई रियली वांटेड टू डू दिस इंटरव्यू टुडे वाज बिकॉज़ आई थिंक इट्स सो इंपोर्टेंट टू गेट द मैसेज आउट देयर एंड टू टू नो काइंड ऑफ इंक्रीस दीस कन्वर्सेशंस दैट वी आर हैविंग नॉट जस्ट इन द मीडिया but in in the community at community level because i know in my experiences around anxiety one of the reasons why i set up self help and the design anxiety group was because i wanted to connect with other people because i felt so isolated it's a very lonely experience um having anxiety i would say find as much information as you possibly can from both ends of the spectrum from from your gp from any other medical practitioner seek out more natural ways of of dealing with the menopause get as much information as you can and education and reach out to other women you know there are a lot of women going through this and there are groups out there so seek out help from your family your friends and don't be afraid to to vocalize what's going on so the f in menopause is is my facebook group i set it up um because i was beginning to to work in menopause and i wanted to connect with other women who were experiencing menopause and understand what their experience was but i also i was really aware that what had happened to me had happened because 
I didn't know it was coming and I didn't know what to look out for. And it just became apparent that it was really important that women knew what they were looking for and what their options were so that they could advocate for themselves, which I think is the number one menopause survival skill is self-advocacy. Take the power, take the power by educating yourself and you choose how you want your menopause to be treated because it's your menopause, it's nobody else's and you have got the answers and you can have a good menopause with right information and the right support around you and the right people and GPs and nurses that are going to listen. And if they don't, put your red lipstick on and let them know that you're not going away. I wish I'd understood that, um, that you can be more in charge of your own health and that you don't just have to um, leave all the responsibility to the doctors and just accept what they say. That, you, that actually listening to your body and being connected with your body is a healthy thing to do and that it's important to be aware of what's happening to you all through your life, especially as women. Everybody should, but especially as women. I don't know if women don't talk to younger women about it because we all think, oh, it's boring or it's too worrying to... to burden younger women with all of this when they're not actually having to go through it. But I think it is really important. People need to have the information about what can happen to them. So I have menopausal women who I train and now I also do workshops for menopausal, perimenopausal, menopausal or postmenopausal women. And we actually even do workshops or we can do workshops for men. And that's about men understanding um, what women are going through. And when I think back now, I wish I could have done the same and again with this menopause and everything else and that's to do with the understanding and get people away and get the men just to think about it. What your wife does for you, your partner does for you, we need to give something back now to them and, and uh, hopefully get out the need. And uh, God, again, that some of my husband and I have two cars और दोनों को एक दूसरे का ख्याल रखना चाहिए बीवी तो बहुत ज्यादा अगर हमारे कल्चर में बीवियां बहुत ख्याल करती हैं हस्बैंड्स का वहां उनको इस स्टेज पे समझना भी चाहिए हम दर्दी की भी जरूरत होती है खास तौर पे जैसे जिंदगी गुजर जाए गुजर चुकी होती है लेकिन इस स्टेज पे आके हस्बैंड को बहुत ज्यादा अपनी बीवी के साथ हम दर्दी प्यार से रहना चाहिए क्योंकि बहुत चेंजिंग्स आती हैं बड़ा सेंसिटिव हो जाती है मूड कभी बदलता है कभी दिल चाहता है रोने को कभी दिल चाहता है हंसने को कभी दिल चाहता है कि खुश हो कभी चुप रहने को दिल चाहता है तो डिफरेंट डिफरेंट स्टेजेस लाइफ में आती रहती हैं आई वुड हैव लाइक टू हैव नोन एंड आई थिंक एवरी वुमन गर्ल एवरीबॉडी शुड नो दैट यू कैन बी अफेक्टेड साइकोलॉजिकली एंड स्पेशली थ्रू एंजाइटी आई थिंक एवरीबॉडी शुड नो दैट एज इफ यू आर अवेयर ऑफ इट यू कैन डील विद इट but if you're not aware of what, of what is causing it, how can you deal with that? Don't suffer in silence because, you know, a problem shared is often a problem halved. And there's so much support out there now, particularly in this great city here in Manchester. It's not like how it was in the mid 90s when I started suffering with anxiety. I think the more we are open about it, the more we have a society which recognises menopause, um, the more we will be able to um, live a longer, much more healthier and fulfilling life for all women in their menopausal years. Um, unless families understand um, women in, in the house going through menopause, I don't think people can support each other truly. So yes, 100%. All young girls, all young boys must be told about menopause. I think it's a powerful time. I think it's a time where, taken in a positive way, that a lot of women can feel free from having periods, free from menstrual problems, free from the fear of getting pregnant, that she can feel a lot more energised, that she can feel, have that time where her family are growing up 
and that she has a lot more freedom. A time when she's a lot, that I see with older women is a lot of older women or older women that I know start to think about the wider society, start to think about the future that the children or the grandchildren are going up into. And I'm finding a lot of old women are stamping their feet and saying no, that we're unhappy with the things that are going on within the world. So my advice for every woman that's at any phase of the menopause transition is educate yourself. Knowledge is key. Find out as much as you can about the menopause so that you are in control of your own menopause. Know your own body so that you then can delineate whether this is stress, it's poor quality sleep, or it actually might be the perimenopause graduating into your life. For me, education, education. Watch as many webinars as you can and then a Track people into your life that are going through the same thing. Learn together and go through it together. It can be a magical time in your life. It's getting better um, and I think I'm, I'm op optimistic in another two, three years. I think we will be in a place where every woman has help and support when she goes through this. Who is the priority? And we all know that women prioritise themselves and their health last. Women serve their partners, women serve their children first, last, and that has to, that dynamic has to change. Women, I hope with this film that the, you know, the medical profession, professionals will get a hold of it. We can send it to them and they will take action. That's what I want is action. What I want is services. What I want is women to be served. What I would hope is that women now will start to be able to live their best menopause. A story that I like to, to give to women is the one about the killer whale. And the killer whale that is, is one of the only mammals outside human beings that has a menopause. So it's like we do this for a reason. I think there's only three mammals that do it. The rest just carry on reproducing until they die. We don't, there is this stop time, this transition. In the killer whale, the female, when she's menopausal, swims right to the front of the pod and she's seen as a leader because she has the skills and the experience to ensure the survival of that pod.